Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you back for episode two, season two of Unsung. Uh, to all you like-minded spirits and individuals, music, art, dancing, acting, all of those things, I welcome you. And this show is about you. It's a, a way for me to give acclaim to the people that I respect and the people I think that we all respect. And I have one of those people here today. Now, just a little backstory, and I gotta get to this quick, but I've known this woman now for a long time. I've probably known her since she was seven years old. And I remember her dad. I asked him one time, him and I played in the church together here in Calgary. And we were talking about our kids. You know, what are your kids up to? What are your kids? And he said, you know, my, my, my kids are playing music now. And I thought, oh my God, that is so cute. And then I watched this now woman grow into a fabulous artist. So, ladies and gentlemen, along with me, I want you to welcome Lisa Jacobs. Lisa, how the hell are you doing? <laughs> I'm so good. Actually, genuinely, I'm doing really great right now. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I am uh, I'm, I'm thankful that you're here today. Uh, and let me ask you the first question then. Why are you so good? What makes Lisa Jacobs good today? Oh, honestly, I think that anytime there's a moment in your life when... Well, in my life, when there isn't a whole bunch of drama or like major, major hardships going on, it's just like extra wonderful. And right now I just have like, I have work happening. Um, I have lots of like lovely personal life things happening and friendships and relationships and new work opportunities, like similar and um, sort of like known to me work opportunities, things that are challenging me, things that feel super familiar and comfortable. And so like life, it's pretty good, all things considered. And also, I think, since we've been kind of in the middle of um, the pandemic, one of the things... Pandemic? That, <laughs> what? One of the things that I've taken away... What's has that? Really <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. That's okay. I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> one of the things that I've really been kind of practicing and taking away and, like, really have been working on is being in the moment. Because I don't know what the future is going to bring. And also just trying to think about... All the potential, I mean, it's just doing that has made me feel sad and worried and frustrated. And so I've just been like navigating this particular time with just like being grateful for what's happening right now because whatever's happening right now is actually happening because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and if it will actually still happen. And so I'm not too worried about all of that stuff. I'm just like grateful for these things right now. So that feels good. I feel oh, great. That's awesome. <laughs> And so, in a sense, you're talking about living in the moment. Absolutely. Right. Now, there's a difference between saying it and living it. And it seems to me like you're kind of getting a handle on what it means to live that way. So, yeah. and, and you're saying it feels good. Go ahead. I'd, I'd like to hear just more about how that feels for you. Um, well, I think the thing about the pandemic is that, and especially as a person in the music industry and has someone who like when things shut down I already had like a lot of my life for the future planned out and it was based on travel based on people being able to get together and be in places and watch music and us being able to go places and all those things sort of like maybe it's gonna happen maybe it's not gonna happen and so I would say I would just more kind of forced into the opportunity that is living in the moment and uh, and also just sort of like having lived a few more years of life where I think in my early 20s I really worried about the future, worried about what I was going to do, worried if I was going to amount to literally anything. And uh, and now I know that like we're just going to continue to feel like that our whole lives. So like why bother worrying about all of that stuff and just like do things right now and, uh, and try and be as much in what's happening right now so that I, I personally can have gratitude for the things that I'm in. Whereas before, I think I missed a lot of like the beautiful moments that were happening because I was already thinking on to mm. the next thing, already worrying about the next thing, already like forging ahead and um, missed sort of like the brilliance that is like whatever is going on now. And I also am like a huge um, lover and almost advocate of just like the simple joys. So I like to relish in those and like take them in because I think they add happiness to, um, and they make things better, like when you can just enjoy small things. And so 
Um, I've always really valued that as a person, and I think more so even now. So even simple things like the opportunity to have a conversation with another person. The feeling of the sun finally coming out in the middle of winter and like that light hitting your face, like I soak that in. And I think basically it's just so that I just don't feel so sad. <laughs> right. <laughs> just to stave off the depression. <laughs> I'll do whatever it takes. So. No, I think that's, you know, I mean, here's the thing. <laughs> you know, we can, we can think that we're unique in that perspective. Mm -hmm. And yet, in some ways, and, and some of the things that I've read about, is that especially in times like this, in terms of pandemics, there is an inward thing that happens. Mm. There is a, 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 an ability, a chance, a moment for us to turn inward and to ask ourselves, you know, some really tough questions. And tell me if I'm correct in this, but in some respects, I think what I'm hearing you saying is that to be in the moment is to be okay with you, meaning that you don't have to prove anything. You don't have to necessarily be anything to anyone else. I think if there's anything that this time has shown me, it's, mm. it's brought me to an awareness of, of who I am, both the good and the bad. Not that I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peterson. In this respect, you know, it's, it's that understanding that I have the capacity for tremendous good or amazing harm. Mm. And, you know, I've really sat with that over the last two years. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm doing this again, is because, you know, you make a choice. You know, you're going to make the world worse, or at least your world worse, mm -hmm. or are you going to try and make it better? Mm -hmm. And are you going to try to, like you said, connecting with people? Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Right? Over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. That's been very difficult, especially us as artists uh, need to be connected. Mm. I mean, that's where I'm not an A type personality, so I love it sitting alone. And of course I do because I edit eight hours a day and nobody's <laughs> going to sit there and talk to me when I'm doing it uh, for their own sake. But I get energy from creating with people. I get energy from the the thoughts of other people mm -hmm. the tremendous thoughts and sometimes i get energized from the lesser thoughts uh i guess that's where you start to understand what do i know and what don't i know i know what i'm good at but what am i not good at and where are those people where can i be lifted up for lack of a better term. <laughs> i know i know we're going back christian said no but you know what i mean i mean where can i be lifted up by the thoughts and the and the the greatness uh, that is everyone, you know, that is in everyone, and mm -hmm. I think I love the fact that musicians love to bring that out of each other. Mm -hmm. And there are great ideas around this town. I know you're involved in some of the Queen tour, fabulous, fantastic. Uh, I'm involved in in some uh, sort of uh, expansive drummer uh, concepts. You know, I'm involved in these kind of things. What are the things, are you creating anything these days? Um, yeah. Well, I think that it's been very cool because lately I've been given a bunch of different opportunities to be involved, maybe not lately, but it's ongoing, to be involved in the music community in different sorts of ways than just contributing as a musician. Um, and so lately I've been sort of tied into things like the Music Cities convention that happened and Calgary was hosting it. Um, for this year and so I got to be one of the co-hosts and be a part of like taking in sort of like um, the scope of what a conference like that looks like and I've been um, emceeing and hosting activities down for like an outdoor festival but I've also been able to be an artist curator for Chinook Blast which is an outdoor festival in Calgary right winter can I, festival right can I stop you just for a sec mm -hmm. I just want to rewind just a little bit I okay. want to walk this back just just for a second for my own sake and probably for the people watching music cities yeah can you define that and explain it because I, I I've heard of it I read the prospectus mm -hmm. on it but I don't know that much about it I saw you MC it by the way on Facebook <laughs> uh, good job 
But can you explain that to us? What is Music Cities? What is it doing? Uh, what is it doing for the city? How is it vital? All that kind of stuff. So my kind of understanding of this particular Music Cities convention is that it's taking a look at um, the arts industries, particularly music, kind of on a broader um, scope and broader perspective than just the creation of music. So it's looking at things like the economics around it. What does economically music and musicians and venues generate in a city? It's looking at using music um, in regard to city planning. So if you're going to make a community and an inner city community more safe and more vibrant, how could, the arts are one of the parts of um, the arts really help to contribute to that. When you, when you fill a place with art, it means more people will come down. When you fill a place with music venues, more people show up there, which means shady activities don't happen as much because they just there's, a, there's more space for other things to go on. It's not that same kind There's of more way. people and more accountability. Yeah. And so, um, and using the arts and not just like industry and, and uh, it's also using the arts to create spaces like that. Um, the Music Cities Convention also was kind of like looking at making sure um, artists are getting paid and talking about that. Looking at things like when we're talking about all ages venues, we're not talking about just um, how important it is for our youth to be connected to the city, but also like what are sort of some of the impediments to that and one of them are sometimes city bylaws that can be a factor in that creating safe spaces and so um, that particular convention from what I gathered is that it was really looking at things beyond just um, musicians and just how um, music and living in a place collide actually Luke Azevedo who is the film commissioner here in Alberta he has this great quote and he said creating a city that you can work in and also creating a city that you can live in. That's not the exact quote, but it's the idea. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Paraphrase. Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, I had Rob Asiak on last week. Mm -hmm. And Rob was talking a lot about bylaws. We were talking about bills like uh, Bill 75 and what's that, what that does for musicians. And then what are the things that it doesn't necessarily cover? How important are those things? And should there be perhaps, bylaws in place to, um, I hate to use the word mandate these days, to, you know, help clubs, uh, incentivize clubs, so that they actually can pay more of a living wage. Mm -hmm. uh, not only that, but I think when you have that, then you have the ability of the club itself to, uh, to, perhaps necessarily insist on who they want as artists in their clubs. So if they're going to, let's say, buy into the living wage thing with, with incentivization such as uh, tax breaks on property, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, that save them money in order that they can give some money back, uh, then they can also have a say in who they want in their club. Like you have to be this tall to ride. Now, I know that that alludes back to, because I'm, I'm a bit of an older guy, it alludes back to the 80s and the 70s, uh, when there were such a thing, when there was so much music, so much music on a civic level, that there were A rooms, B rooms, and C rooms. I'm not saying that it has to be that way today, but I'm saying that there was so much music to be had. There were so many people that wanted to play that clubs were able to dictate what kind of ability walked into their club? What kind of curated band uh, they were going to choose from? And so the C rooms didn't get as paid, of course, as much as the B rooms. And the B rooms didn't get paid as much as the A rooms, but everybody wanted to be in the A room. So that created the ability to practice harder and the determination to become, what? Uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, just better at what you do, you know? And that was good for art. Uh, because people were creating greater works. They were getting better themselves. And then they were teaching, you know, the, the C room guys how to, you know, raise the level of their performance. It was a very healthy thing. And it wasn't driven even by any mandate. It was driven by just a, a, an understanding, an, an unwritten rule mm -hmm. that everyone understood. And I thought that that's amazing that people cannot talk about something and that it's actually instinctive. 
I think that the way sort of like I see, um, I see that there are a lot of cover venues and um, places where cover bands have opportunities to play and then there are um, venues that are almost exclusively host to people that do either a mix of their original music and, um, and covers or solely um, original music. And so I think that's one of the things that really um, shifts the kinds of venues that people choose to play and who plays where and for what, for what kind of durations, you know. Um, those are, that's kind of where I see like a more distinctive thing. And then as far as like dreaming about places and opportunities to play, um, I don't really, I've never really thought about it in an A, B, or C circuit kind of thing. I also don't like to categorize stuff like that, um, just personally, but I've really have seen it as kind of like, um, one day I hope that I get to play like larger venues or soft seaters or, you know, um, arenas, or those kinds of things. One day I hope to play a show where everybody's paying attention to me 100% of the time, right? And those are the kinds of things that I more dreamed of, and those being sort of markers of um, me having opportunities, um, rising to the occasion of those opportunities, and also amassing, you know, more skills over time. So that's sort of more of the way that I've sort of seen it and dreamed about it in my, in my world. Mm, yeah, and that's sort of where I've seen sort of sort of like felt different kinds of feelings of success has been like once upon a time I, um, you know I saw in in uh, junior high school I saw a musical they took us to the Jack Singer Theater, and I actually sat in the front row and I could wa I actually spent half of the musical most of the musical watching the orchestra pit because you know I'm a musician it was way more interesting to me, <laughs> um, you know and then like. Having those opportunities to dream about like one day standing on those stages, actually, and I think that's one of the things that's so important about and valuable about watching live music and going out to places and seeing it and exposing children to live music. It's because it allows you in the moment of like taking in a performance and taking in, in entertainment for all of its messages. I think that it offer, also offers a space for creative people um, and performers to dream and to imagine themselves somewhere than being in the seat, you know, mm. being on the stage. And so that's been really cool. Like, I remember the first time that I walked out on stage at the Jack Center, like, that was cool. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And looked out at all of that. That was a thing that I had sort of just, like, loosely dreamed about or imagined. And there's been lots of moments in my life where, you know, those were things that were, like, possibilities, perhaps, who knows, but just in the back of my mind. And, uh, and some of them have unfolded. We don't always talk about this as musicians, but playing all of them in different kinds of capacities, they all offer something different musically. Like, um, there's also, I've, I remember there's been some great moments of joy when I was playing at a club and um, there wasn't like a ton of people really paying attention. I didn't have to be so precious about the music. I didn't have to be so like, exacting about everything and in the because because the room didn't require that you know when you play a theater show and it's and you're playing a specific kind of show that requires um precision at every moment um you don't take the kinds of risks that you would take when you're playing at a loud club and so um for me personally and i think it's of benefit to a lot of people to just like mix up the vibe go somewhere where you don't have to feel so important and the stress of that like importance and the pressure of it so that you can like have a different kind of musical experience where you can um, in, engage with the people that you're playing with in different kinds of ways. I think I think all of that's really valuable. I think it's also like um, for emerging, for growing artists and for anyone trying something new no matter where they are in, in the span of their career, trying something new and with courage, to not be in a place where everyone's staring at you in dead quiet um, you know, like, I think that a lot of new artists really just want everyone to, like, listen to them. But, like, the way you cut your teeth oftentimes and create your show and figure out what's working and what's not working is, and figure out how to, like, engage an audience is to have to deal with the fact that no one cares about who you are. So you have to figure out how to make people care about you. And you have to, like, go out and reach out to them. And I think that the adversity of that, even though it's not that fun as a musician, because it sucks when people are talking while you're playing. Um, 
you know, or no one's dancing while you're like killing it on stage. The adversity of like things not being easy means that you learn how to win people's hearts over and you find musical ways to do that. You find ways in your performance to do that and you end up creating shows. And so I think that we need as players just like across across our careers like a, a like a whole like expanse of like those kinds of experiences and that they all shape us and have the potential to make us better musicians. The thing that I think that can get really daunting and really hard for um, artists is that when you do too much of the same thing, it can be, um, it can kind of like put you in this like zone of comfort and like where you're not creating or where you're not pushed into the next thing. And I also think that um, it can also make you complacent and actually feel kind of shitty about yourself and your situation. And so I personally love to mix things up. Um, you know, if I'm playing way too many corporate shows, um, I just start to hate people. I start, I start to hate making people dance. I hate playing pop music. Um, and I just long for something that feels really different than that, like some quiet like coffee shop or folk music or whatever else. And if, if I'm playing too many, um, if I'm playing too many gigs that are like really like acoustic -y, I miss the like vibrance of like like just rocking out or just being like a huge version of myself, you know? And so um, I, I personally, I also like who I am loves balance, like a lot. So like maybe other people don't really need this, but I need like a nice mix of things just to keep me like feeling um, pretty great. And in the same vein, I also really um, love to be in situations where I am both like a leader and know what I'm doing and I'm in charge and I also think it's really valuable and important for me all along my career to be in situations where I am the underdog, where I'm the least experienced, where I am just like soaking in whatever kind of guidance, expertise and skill I can get from any, everyone around me. And I think that too many opportunities on either side of that coin um, can either mean like if you spend too much time always being the other dog, it can really crush your spirit. Because <laughs> you always feel shitty. And if you spend too much time where you're the best person in the room, it also means that like you don't have a lot of opportunities for growth or to be challenged. And so um, I love to like do a little bit of both of those things. And fortunately, I think that my career has always, never mind my career, my musical journey from, a ch from my childhood has always just been a mix of those those two sort of like experiences. Wow. That was a whole tangent. <laughs> I don't even Girlfriend, remember you are open it up, let me tell you right now. <laughs> um, so I think that's very interesting what you were saying, uh, or what you are saying. Uh, you know, I remember I was in Brooks Hotel. Certainly uh, not the San Jose. And I'm there with, uh, with a country band and Jason Graham. I don't know if you know Jason, but he was the, uh, or is the guitar player in the fusion uh, trio. And so Jason's up there playing. And he, Jason told me this story, right? So he's playing and he's like, uh, you know, like, you know, Brooks Hotel, Brooks, Alberta. There's maybe eight people out there and six of them had their foreheads on the table. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and the other two, I don't know, it's like a guy at the bar trying to pick up the chick, you know, so nobody's listening. And so Jason's just like, oh, fuck it. You know, like, what, what time is it? And where are we going? You know, and he looks over at me, and I have my head down, my eyes closed, and I'm just giving everything I've got to the moment. Mm -hmm. And so when Jason tells me this story afterwards, he says, you know, when I looked at you, it was like, it was like this biggest moment of accountability because I realized that I'm not there for the people. I'm not there uh, whether there are people or whether there are not people. Mm. Doesn't matter if I'm at Brooks or New York. Music should not suffer either way. These are the great lessons I think music teaches us. I want to get on to the Queen tour. Uh, I'm sure the people watching me, interested. Um, you guys, I mean, you were out there for probably over a year. And I know you did Canada, the U.S., uh, Europe. 
Uh, no, so it was so the We Will Rock You um, tour that we did. It's a musical based in, solely on Queen's music, which was so cool to play. And um, the tour that I went on was exclusively North America, and so we were in the States and Canada for six months. Um, I forget how many shows we played in that time, like a hundred and like forty or something. Wow. Like that. Yeah. So I got the call for that gig. Um, so I was playing bass on it. So I just got to like ex learn John Deacon's parts. And um, I have never been like one of those players that is really great at playing the exact same time, same to thing every time. There are players that learn the music and then can do that. And um, I really love to like be more in the moment and like I learn stuff and I can execute that. But I also just like love to feel what's happening in the moment. And so. To play the kind of show that requires precision in that way 100% of the time, that was um, something I considered to be an exciting new discipline. And something that is a discipline for me that I would have to work hard at. And so um, the people that put together the music for that show, um, they basically amalgamated the Queen's like recordings and then their live shows and pieced together like the most excellent bass line ever. Um, based on those two things and so um, they were really specific about their job and so I wanted to like create exactly that while also um, bringing just who I am in my own spirit to kind of the music because I think that um, well actually I can't do anything about that because I am a living breathing existing human being and it just who I am is injected into the music so <laughs> that part was like, really wild because I had to play like the exact same thing every night for sh all of those shows and um, Sometimes the band was hidden away, and then sometimes we were like live in front of the audience. But that too was its own kind of like interesting situation. And uh, we played for, we traveled a lot, and we played for a long time. So when you were talking about kind of like finding the music within, well, that was that's also something that I deeply value and have been cultivating for a very long time. And so there would be moments when we have this like awesome band, we can play the show in the sleep in our sleep. We're like behind this giant screen. And uh, it's so dark that I have like glow, like stickers that glow in the dark to mark my fretboard so I can see where I'm playing because that's how dark it is backstage, right? But we can mm -hmm. play the whole show. Was it a reading gig? Um, well, we were given this. We were given the music, yeah. but like I, I didn't. I, it's not going to be fun for me to read that gig, like to read a rock gig like that. Plus, we have like, like I memorized the show. Ah, yeah, you know, good for you. Because that for me that matters. Yeah. And uh, internalize also, it. Internalize yeah, it. Yeah. And like, it's just way more fun. Like, it's not that fun for me to stare at the notes. Also, because reading, like, isn't my best. Like, my ears are better. I can read, but it's just not my, the greatest gift that I have. I haven't, like, been developing it as much. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, but, it, but it was cool because the players, like, the two guitar players that were hired for the show, um, neither of them can read. So, one of them got their friend to, like, record all of the parts and then he learned it by ear and then um, the other one had his like wife like figure out the charts for him so it's that kind of show like the music director Russell Broom who put it together he really wanted to feel like um, the heart of kind of like that band so he didn't want to just get a bunch of like session musicians who are all excellent readers you know like he art. wanted it more organic a little bit yeah, yeah. so yeah. um and I, I understood like kind of the heart and the spirit of that but it was um but there were moments when we didn't see an audience, we've been playing the show for a long time, we're on the road, and you know, like, when you're on the road for a while, your spirit, like, it, it moves up and down, how you're feeling about it all. But I just knew, like, I really believe that you can feel the kind of energy that's coming out from, so the notes might sound the same, but I, I always want to deliver a certain kind of spirit when I'm playing. And so I would just find sometimes the space within myself to rock out so hard. And so we would do all these things backstage when no one could, or not backstage, but like behind the screen when no one could see us. We would be like, we made up dance routines to keep the energy alive. No one can see them. We're being idiots. But it's just basically like have a little bit of fun and stay connected to our musicians and stay alive and grateful for the things that we we're experiencing. And sometimes I would go like totally internal and just like, fall into the music in really special and beautiful ways. And one of the things that I found that was a true gift of all of us playing the same thing over and over again every night is that, one, I really got to dive into what John Deacon was doing as a bass player and sort of like the melodic nature of his writing style, which is some of it is so weird, and then just also a lot of the Queen stuff bass-wise is just like really groovy 
and just like repetitive groove, groove patterns. And so I got the best of both worlds. Mm. And it was so exciting to, to just like um, dive into someone's playing like that. But the other thing that was really special is that once all of my parts were like fully identified, there were all these like beautiful tiny intricacies in the music that everyone else was playing that because I heard it every single night, I got to just like hear the nuances in everyone else's parts and how it worked and the interplay. And so I really got to study that music and the way that my bandmates um, articulated that music in a really special way. So that was a gift of like doing that many shows. Um, a gift in the middle of like, it's also like um, a challenge, a challenge to be able to maintain six months on tour and playing the same show for that long. But isn't it great that we get to experience that as musicians? You know, that's what I love about artists, uh, musicians. And I'm talking to you people out there. Uh, I mean that. The fact that it takes a certain individual to be able to focus that much on a singular thing, you know, to get that good. Absolutely. And then piecing that sort of idea about, like, the minuteness within the moments of the music and seeing all of that. Um, and then also like like um, panning back and seeing like putting on a whole show and what the audience is experiencing and seeing and how does that all work. And because there's so much more um, to music and to a show and to like um, the experience of people experiencing music than just like all those tiny little cool things you're doing on your bass guitar, right? And, uh, and because also, who cares about all those tiny little things that you're doing on the bass guitar if, it, if um, they're not allowing you to connect with the people around you in any kind of way, you know? And, and so I think being able to like go back and forth into, in all of that is so exciting and such a great way to kind of like view life but also do our art and, um, and find new fresh ways to enjoy something that, like I've been playing, I mean I've been playing music since I was three. I started playing piano when I was three. And like I've been playing professionally on the bass since I was 12. So like a really long time. And to just find ways to just keep the life and the excitement about creating still there. You know, I'm working on a show right now where it's a pop show, but we're taking down and stripping it down like to nothing. So the singer is going to be singing and I'm going to be playing bass or piano or guitar on it. And, uh, and we've been like looking at our songs and just finding ways to realize it. But what's been so fun is that when there's almost no instrumentation, that the silence like matters so much. And these tiny little things that often get lost when there's like lots of, there's lots of instruments on stage, which is also very exciting. But like those tiny little things, like me having just like an eighth note rest on my bass part, you know, in the context, if you've got percussion and drums and guitar, like, no one notices that. But when it's just my bass and one voice, that sort of just, like, moment of breath, it means everything. And so to build a show where, like, those kinds of, like, I get to be a part of creating music where um, it's that sort of, like, precise, where we get to, like, move into that kind of stuff to create the emotion and to, to be able to deliver the message, that's super exciting, too to be able to like go on either sort of like extremes of it all. So, yeah. No, that, <laughs> no, that's great, that's great. No, don't be uh, apologetic or, or anything. I mean, that's beautiful what you say. In terms of, you know, this thing called giftedness, you know, that, that uh, you know, that's one of the things that bothered me about church is that people said, uh, you know, oh God has gifted you so much and you know, I, I'd say, well, yeah, but I didn't see Jesus in the practice room once. You know, I mean, that was me. That was my hard work. So how do you feel about that kind of concept? You know, the, the, the maybe the blessing of, as opposed to the hard work that it takes. I think in the conversation, when we're talking about giftedness and hard work, etc., mm. I think that there's no denying the fact that people are born with inclinations towards certain kinds of things. And that even when I look at my own life, there are things that I can't take credit for. And I, um, you know, like, there's musical, there's things about me musically that I literally didn't work for at all. They were gifted to me. So I just woke up one day, or I arrived on this planet with perfect pitch. Like, I didn't actually work for that, it's there. Um, 
you know, like I, I, uh, people always compliment my smile, but like I didn't actually work for that. Like my, it's my parents' fault. Those sort of ideas. Um, and I think that sometimes when you're natural inclination, naturally inclined towards something, when you do it a lot, it actually doesn't feel like hard work. And then I think a lot of people that are really talented um, underestimate who they are and how they've worked for things and kind of feel shitty about themselves because they think it should have been harder because we live in this world where it's like hustle, 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 like work hard, all of these kinds of ideas and if something feels natural, it doesn't feel like hard work. So I think that I pref I prefer to use a word like diligence where, um, and so diligence isn't always difficult and sometimes it is very much so, but it's sort of just like consistently um, honoring things that you've been given um, so that they can come to light in, a, in whatever way that looks like. It doesn't mean that anyone might even be able to see it. It just means that you're able to enjoy the things that you feel naturally inclined towards, you know? And um, I think that also, there are a lot of musicians that have spent a lot more time working way harder than I do. Um, and so I personally am one of those people that feel like shit about my musical ability because I'm like, oh my god, if I just worked as hard at, at any of this as anyone else, or if I loved practicing my bass guitar in my room for 20 hours, or even five hours, you know? But when I was growing up, I just, that wasn't my approach to bass at all. And I, and I started, and I really looked down at myself for a very long time, and I started to kind of like look at it and be like, well, the way that I learned how to play bass was with other people. And bass guitar is a totally relational instrument. It exists solely for the purpose of making everyone else sound better in many regards. Like clunking out whole notes or whatever else on your bass at home alone, like it's not that fun actually. What's fun is the way that it relates to other people. And so my greatest joy was finding a bazillion opportunities to um, practice the art of playing music by like literally playing music, you know, and that didn't mean like, I mean, I practiced at home a lot because otherwise you won't be able to play your instrument at all. Right. Um, but I had a lot of opportunities to make music with people and for the bass guitar, that's always been my approach to it and when I play it, it's very connected. Um, but on the piano, on the other hand, I have spent way more hours at home alone playing the piano than I have in public ever. And that has been a, an instrument that's been um, a different kind of place of expression for me. And so, and no one would even know how hard I'm working or not working at that. I just play it all. I have played it for my whole life a lot, just of my own accord. And so, um, I think there's like a lot of different ways to sort of tackle the things that are quote unquote our gifts. And, uh, and there's different kinds of ways to approach it. And um, I think in life, our relationship with our gifts is always sort of like is moving and ebbing and flowing and transitioning and that is a beautiful thing you know I think that there have been times when I have loathed the things I'm good at and I know basically every musician I know has loathed the fact loathed the fact that they've been good at something you know because I think when you feel like shit about your career or that your career is not going the way that you want it to go or sometimes I started to notice when people started to hit their 30s they felt like and now they have to make a choice about whether they're going to stay in the music industry or if they're going to like go and get a real job right and so um, I've watched a lot of my friends to kind of like navigate what it feels like to be excellent to do a great job to be a killer singer to have created a show and then for people to be excited about what you do and then say things like, why aren't you famous? And when you're in a bad place in your world, it's like you loathe the fact that you're good at something because why That's aren't you famous? <clears throat> you know, and it means that you didn't do enough of your job in some kind of way. And so I know that's not what people mean, but it, it really like, there, there is this sort of like undercurrent about that kind of idea and that idea that like, being great musically means that you should be famous. And I think that um, we, we get a lot of messaging like that, and it's even more so now. Actually, you don't even have to be good at anything. You just want to be famous, which is a, a whole other thing. But I well, really think that, like... Um, I totally understand what you're saying. And as far as I'm concerned, these are man-made constructs. They are not necessarily based on on mastery or curation 
it's celebrity. It's something that we've made up in order to both ensure that we can't arrive at a certain place and then knock that place uh, when what we put on that pedestal doesn't live up to our expectations. I think that it's, it's a terrible thing. And I think that's one of the reasons that civic music is necessarily gone because everybody thinks they need to be famous. I know you only got a couple minutes left. I'd like, if you can, just take a few minutes because you're involved with a lot of the mental health aspects of music. So can you just kind of run that down for us what that means, what that feels like, uh, you know, the nuances of that? Well, I have my um, degree in music therapy, and so I also practice that in addition to being a musician. And I think I, I work more than just in the mental health capacity, but um, I think I obviously went into music therapy because I can see how music is connected to us in, in ways that we can express ourselves and do that without necessarily having to use word, words, which I think is really important, um, and finding ways to connect with others socially, um, and we can do that without even being able to speak the same language, we can do that using music. I think music also creates a, an incredible container um, for people to just be and exist and live in whatever they are, whatever they're feeling in the moment, and so that's a real value. Um, music is also, there's tons of research happening between what's going on in your brain when music is going on, and so um, serotonin is being released, there's endorphins happening, so there's a lot of different kinds of connections between music and the brain as well. I've spent a lot of time thinking about how um, I am connected to music, and finding ways to, regardless of musical ability, have other people connect to some of the, the things and the beautiful things that we experience as musicians. Um, to find ways for people who don't know how to play, to be able to play something. And to, I have like a car full of accessible percussion instruments, you know, and we create those sort of same sort of feelings. And the musical outcome actually isn't a value. The experience of creating music is a value. That's pretty good, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. That's great. And uh, that's such a great answer. Look, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, I want to thank you people for joining in. And this is about all of you. And uh, if you don't think I'm coming for a whole bunch of you, you're wrong. We're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation because I really feel that these, that dialogue and communication are the keys to change and to growth and to making things better for everyone. So thank you very much, all of you, for tuning in and we'll see you very shortly. And there we go. <laughs> Bam, just like that.